Welcome to worship today at First Baptist Church in Macomb on January 2nd, 2022. I had to practice really hard to say 2022. New Year's greetings to everyone. We're glad you're participating in our worship experience this evening, this, this morning or whenever you're watching. A um, couple things, since this is a YouTube broadcast, I have to say every so often those things that all YouTubers seem to say. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel and to the videos because that conveys to the YouTube algorithm that something's going on that you're interested in and you think is important. You'd be surprised how many messages I get from people who've watched things that have been linked from other people doing that. It's just, just so that you know. Um, second, um, I suspect very soon, I've been kind of mentioning this periodically, I suspect very soon that we will stop doing a pre-recorded online worship service and we will have a delayed um, worship service, so it will not be plausibly live like we've been doing pretty much since the pandemic started. Um, we will be um, taping most of what happens in the 930 in-person service and then showing it later that day or Monday, just so that you're aware of that. Um, that'll be a change that's going to, for a lot of logistical reasons, just to make things work a little smoother. Um, I think that's all of the big announcements I need to do. Thanks for being here. We're going to be looking at Psalm 147, or portion of Psalm 147. Uh, one of the traditional passages we use is we transition from Christmas season, because we're in the ninth day of Christmas today, into Epiphany, where we celebrate the light coming to the world and, and from that experience. Uh, similar to what we've been doing, since we're still in Christmas time, um, uh, much of the worship service today will be videos of music that we have the rights to use and all those things that go with that. And then I will come back and lead us in a prayer at the time of offering and just to set up the other things that will be happening in today's worship. Let me lead us in an opening prayer. Holy God, we thank you that you are the Almighty. You are the All-Powerful. We thank you that you have done so much for us. We just ask right now that you help us in this time. Help us to worship. Help us to view you as, as you said, to worship in spirit and in truth. And to remember all that you have done for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And what a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. 
Yeah. 
sun of righteousness Light in life to all he brings Risen with healing in his wings Mild he lays his glory by One man may no more may die Born to raise the sons of earth Born to give them second birth Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King So we sing hallelujah Our Redeemer has a cry We sing hallelujah Let the King be lifted high We join with the heavens Praise the one who comes to save King has come 
Before I lead us in our time of offering is when, once again, we appreciate the giving that you do that allows us to serve, allows us to be, allows us to reach the next generation, all of those things. I want to read to you from John chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. And this is John trying to explain and using Jewish terms and Greco-Roman terms, the mystery and the majesty of God becoming flesh. John 1, verse, starting at verse 10 in the New International Version. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born of natural descent, nor children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory and the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John testified concerning Him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because He was born before me. Out of His fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only God, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you that you are the Holy One. You are the one who came with grace. You are the reason we have any concept of what grace is. Holy God, thank you for that. Thank you that we can give back to you. We can trust in you. And we can be your people. We dedicate these offerings to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing joy. 
places for yonder breeze a new and glorious morn fall on your knees oh hear the His law is love, and His gospel is peace. Yeah. Chains shall He break for the slave is our brother, and in His name all oppression. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise me. Let all within us praise His holy name. Fall on your knees. When Christ was born Oh night Divine Oh night Oh night When Christ was born on night divine on night on night The title of today's sermon is Active Tense Divinity. Now that may seem complicated and it may be, but hopefully you'll track with me as we go along. It's from Psalm 147, 
verses 12 through 20. And I want to read those verses to you here in a few minutes. But before I do, I want to just say two things. One, looking at curriculum that's been written for this text and resources written for this text, I see the words, a weary world rejoices. And if you've been tracking with us through our worship experiences, you'll know why I mention a weary world rejoices and the hope that comes with that. Sometimes it's reassuring as a minister to see that you are tracking with other people who are thinking the same spiritual thoughts as we all sometimes feel like we're in a weary world. Maybe we spend too much time about that. But we feel sometimes weary as people of God have always, to some extent, felt a little weary. Next, I'm going to show you a commercial. Not promoting this company. Actually, I've had less than pleasant dealings with this company, so that's a different conversation. But it was a Super Bowl commercial, I believe, from 2016. This is the shorter version. And I'm going to show it to you, and then I'll come back and try to explain the nonsense. So let me turn it over to that. After years of being treated like she was invisible, it occurred to Mindy she might actually be invisible. But Mindy was actually not invisible. Ooh, what are you doing? Can you see me? Yeah. She had just always been treated that you way. You don't look at me like that. There are worse things than an attractive woman touching your body. Okay. Join the nation that sees you as a priority. Nationwide is on your side. Have you ever felt invisible? Have you ever wished you were invisible? Or wish you didn't feel so invisible? Because we can be on both sides of those situations. In that commercial, there are several different versions of that commercial. I chose the less obnoxious version of that commercial. Um, there's a longer version. You can find it because it's a Super Bowl commercial. She finds, meets Matt Damon, or doesn't meet Matt Damon, finds Matt Damon having dinner and goes to kiss him. And he says, whoa, similar to what happens in that other scene. There's a scene where she is so invisible that she's just sitting on the lawn, barely clothed, and no one notices, and she steals food. She does all kinds of things in this commercial because she feels invisible. And how often do we feel invisible? We feel that no one cares. No one's there. And we wonder what we'll do. We wonder why we should bother to live in accordance with the God who loved us so much that he lived and died and rose from the dead. Now granted... There are some versions of Christianity in which everything's about doing the right thing and being seen doing the right thing, and we do that, and that's how God sees us. But we have so often made God look not the best through those versions of Christianity. But think about this for a second. We feel invisible, and we serve a God who is invisible, who is spirit. And the irony of this of feeling invisible is we wonder if the invisible God even sees us. In a moment, I'm going to return to the teaching room. And we're going to go through the concept of active voice and whether God sees us and whether, whether we really are invisible to God or whether we're not. Title for today, as you can see, is Active Tense Divinity kind of already explored that a little bit in feeling invisible and whether God is really there. And maybe you do writing for work or for school or for a very part-time gig so you can go on vacation and people will pay for it. Whatever you do, you're, little, you're writing for. One of the experiences that we have, because now we have modern technology and we can just insert our document. We've worked all day. We've inserted our document into a WordPress file or something else. We put it in there, and then it evaluates whether it's a good enough writing or not. And it'll say, you know, at least the one I'm familiar with, it'll say, great, which it never says, by the way. Good, which it often says. Okay, which hurts my feelings. And then needs improvement. Dun, dun, dun. And usually the criticism of the writing that I put in is sentences are too long. Yes. Paragraphs are too long, so then I just make the paragraph shorter because I'm not thinking about why I do that. Um, not enough connecting s words in between the sentences, or too much passive voice. Many of us, when we write, we're just writing, thing, we tend to speak of things very passively, 
not where they're actively doing something. Let me just give you an example. And yes, I was hungry when I wrote this. McDonald's is a good place for fries. This is passive voice by definition in writing. Um, nothing wrong with the statement unless you prefer Wendy's fries. Um, it is a good place, but it's very passive. It's kind of distant and disconnected. Or, McDonald's seems like a good, like a place for kids. Now, nothing wrong with that statement, but it's disconnected, very passive between the two. Or, McDonald's drive through is long. If you live here in Macomb, you absolutely know that is a 100% true statement. But it's very passive and disconnected. Like, you're not really involved with it. It's just there. Whereas an active voice, which people will be more engaged in your writing if you use active voice, you would say the same things as, McDonald's sells French fries that people enjoy. It's more active. It talks about how people enjoy it and engaging and going back and forth. Or kids love visiting McDonald's. And some of us know that kids love visiting McDonald's too much. But it shows an attachment between the two, like they're engaged. Or the drive through queue at McDonald's stretches around the building. Now you visualize what happened. Often when we think about God, we think about God as passive and far away versus being active and engaged with us. Now, the writer of Psalm 117, written many, many hundreds of hundreds and thousands of years ago, is struggling with this same issue. Let me just read some of the text and I'll make a few comments along the way and then hopefully make a conclusion at the end for us. Psalm 147, verse 12. Extol the Lord, Jerusalem. Praise your God, Zion. Notice this is not a choice. This is a command. And the two places mentioned are two of the most significant religious places in Jewish tradition. Jerusalem and Zion. Trying to put all these things together. It's not a choice. You should do it. Well, why should we do that? Well, watch the language. Verse 13, he, meaning God, strengthens the bars of your gates. He makes the walls and makes the environment around you safe and blesses your people within you. We get to see why we praise God, because God provides what we need in an active way. He strengthens, strengthens, can't say that word, and blesses. Verse 14, he grants peace to your borders and satisfies you with the finest of wheat. He grants peace and satisfies you with the finest of wheat. Um, granting peace, and we can get into what this means. One of the most special words in all the Jewish language is shalom, meaning peace. But what's going on here is the people having what they need, and he satisfies them with the finest of wheat, which would have been a big deal at that time. God is actively doing these things. He's not just sitting back watching. He's actively doing these things. Let me just read to you verses 15 through 18. He sends his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He spreads the snow like wool and scatters the frost like ashes. He hurls down his hail like pebbles. Who can withstand his icy blast. He sends his word and melts them. He stirs up breezes and the waters flow. Verse 18 in particular kind of gives us an image of the grace and everything we're associated with. God's word. And remember when we're referring to God's word in the biblical text, it most of the time does not refer to the written word we're familiar with. There's nothing wrong with calling it that. It was the Word and the Spirit and the power of God, God's Word. That's why John in John 1 uses the Word was God, the Word was with God, and the Word is God. Because it was a powerful, this is a terrible explanation, but a powerful force that the people went through and embraced. It reminded them of the Ten Commandments being given at Mount Zion. He sends his word, even though there's hail and there's icy blasts, which would have been a big deal in that culture. He sends his word, his voice, his power, his spirit, and it melts them and stirs up the breeze and waters flow. God, for the psalmist, is active and powerful 
in everyday life. He didn't just start the process and kick it in motion and let it go. Verses 19 and 20, which finish out our text for today, read, He has revealed his word to Jacob, his laws and decrees to Israel. He has done this for no other nation. They do not know his laws. Praise the Lord. One of the reasons that we, looking back on this text, embrace this text for this time of year, is it kind of gives us a foreshadowing of the incarnation, of Jesus coming. And yes, there were laws and there were decrees, but God has always been active. God has always been working. And he's working even now. Our psalmist gives praise to God for all the great works that God has done. We are reminded of God's work in creation with all the stars and the clouds and the rain and the grass. We are also reminded that God is not content to simply create, but to also redeem us creatively. God healed the brokenhearted and binds up wounds. God gathers, gathers those who are the outcast of Israel. God feeds the animals and God grants peace. All of these things are in the realm of what God does in the world. And it reminds us that God's redemptive work and his creative work are one and the same. More than anything, when you read this psalm, you should be reminded that God is not done yet. God is still working. God will continue to still be working over and over and over again. Now, intellectually, that may make some sense, and maybe emotionally you're tracking with me, but I want to kind of give you something to remember because we forget these things. I want to introduce you to a phrase you've probably heard many times, you just really haven't had to define in this boring, tedious way that I'm going to do it. It's called deism. Deism is a belief in God, or I'll just read it from the screen, belief in the existence of a supreme being, specifically one who created the whole process, who does not interfere in the universe. So he creates the whole process, then he sits back and just watches. That's a terrible explanation, but just go with that for right now. The term is used chiefly of an intellectual movement of the 17th and 18th centuries that accepted the existence of a creator based on reason, but rejected belief in a supernatural deity who interacts with humankind. Now, if I were to ask you who were deists in our country, in the history of our country, and deism still exists to some extent today, so just clear, one of the most significant deists ever was a man named Thomas Jefferson. You may know him as this man. See, that's what some of you think of Thomas Jefferson. If you have Disney Plus or have seen the Hamilton play, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You visualize this man as Thomas Jefferson. Sadly, it's not the conversation that I'm having right now. Though, he's, though the Hamilton play does a wonderful job of educating people to the history of our country, you probably should visualize this Thomas Jefferson. And one of the things that makes Thomas Jefferson famous and infamous for people who do what I do is the creation of the Jefferson Bible. Now, just so that you're aware... Many people who do what I do dislike the fact that there are 50 million different translations with 50 million different study notes because the study notes that are inside of your Bible are not the inspired word of God. They are people trying to help you with the best intentions, but they are clouded by their perspective. Thomas Jefferson, yes, one of the founding fathers, a great man who we are indebted to as citizens of the United States. We are indebted to as people, citizens of the world was a deist. And I want to make sure I tell this correctly so not to disparage Thomas Jefferson. He's one of the most famous deists ever. He saw God as being passive, not active in our world. And he didn't see God as being involved in the affairs of humanity. He might use language like this, God is sitting and watching. God is waiting. God is powerful. Now, the National Museum of, of American History owns the second of the two Bibles Thomas Jefferson created by editing, I put that in quotes, the Gospels to reflect his understanding of Jesus' true philosophy. 
Jefferson wanted to distinguish Jesus' teachings from what he called the corruption of schismatic followers. Jefferson was heavily influenced by the principle of deism, which I've already defined. So he chose not to include in his Gospels the miracles Jesus performed. In fact, he rejected anything that looked like a miracle because it was contrary to reason. Jefferson's Gospel ends with the description of Jesus' burial, but omits an account of his resurrection. He kept Jesus' own teachings, especially emphasizing the Beatitudes. Now, if you've listened to me and cliches that I say all the time, that I don't have this faith thing figured out, but here's what I know. If someone can predict their own death and resurrection and make it happen, I just do whatever they say. Thomas Jefferson found that to be unreasonable. And so he pulls it out because God is passive or was passive to Thomas Jefferson. Psalm 147, written way before the incredible, intellectual, wonderful man Thomas Jefferson, is an incredible antidote to the idea that God is uninterested in us. The verbs are God actively doing things. I understand it is hard for us living in the 21st century with so much reason and so much technology to think there's an invisible God who cares about us. Who cares about us enough to provide for us, even if we don't notice it. Yet, but we as followers of Jesus, as Christians, not as deists, as Christians, even though we can fall into the trap of thinking that God is passive, Christians believe that God remains active every day, every moment, and lovingly caring and creating new life. As the psalmist reminds us, God's work continues today. God's work never ends. This new year, you may, you may already start to feel invisible. You may feel like God has forgotten about you. God's people have forgotten about you. However, as the psalmist reminds us, God has been working all along. And maybe we missed it. But God has been working all along. God is not just sitting in his rocking chair watching. The psalmist writing this thousands of years ago knew that and could see it. Perhaps the psalmist would scream to us, look around. Be active and you will see the God right there with you. Find where God is working and work with him. Then maybe you will not feel invisible. I want to pray for us, pray for me, as many of us feel invisible through things that we've experienced, things that we are currently experiencing. The psalmist said, do not, because God knows you and is creating new things around you every day. And maybe God, you're part of the new creation. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you that you are the Almighty. And I thank you that even though you are an invisible God, you are spirit. You are active in my life in ways that I can never, ever truly understand. You're not some creator that is just sitting far away, just watching and laughing. You are a God who is here with us. You showed that by living and dying and rising the dead for us. Help me to remember that when I feel down. Help me to remember that when I feel up. Help me to remember that my entire life is based on the fact that you lived and died and rose to the dead for me. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe you have been watching listening and this Christmas tide, Christmas time issue to you just seems like God is distant, it's just some story. The psalmist writing this hundreds of years before Jesus was even born saw that God was active. God can be active for you. Look and see where God is moving. Ask God to show you and if you need help we are here to help you with that. Like I usually say, we may not have all the answers. But we will go on the journey with you. 
We will do what churches are called to do, called to help. Not to do it for you, but to help. And we will be honored to do that. Thank you. We will see you next week, and we'll be looking at This Is My Year from Galatians chapter 5 and reflecting upon that. Thank you for your time, and we'll see you next week.